Hello, and welcome to Idea to IPO. I'm Jason Putnam Gordon, an emerging growth and venture capital attorney with KNL Gates LLP. I'm based in San Francisco, California. I work with emerging growth companies and investors from around the world because many times in venture and tech, you're going to be touching the Bay Area. Today, we're here to discuss how to position your startup for venture capital funding. I'm excited. This is one of my favorite topics. Before we get started, I want to uh, provide you with a little bit of background information. So uh, I'm running today's presentation, all the tech in the background. So uh, with that in mind, I will not be monitoring the chat. I will only be monitoring the Q&A function. Um, and so please forgive me if uh, you know, you're chatting. Feel free to chat amongst yourselves. Additionally, we've got an audience poll, which I'd like to go over in a minute. And to do so, I need you to fill it out. It looks like we're getting uh, good results here. And uh, so please keep doing that. Uh, another note is, of course, this is recorded. And so good news is, if you miss some or all of it, you'll be able to check it out later afterwards. In about a week or so, or a week or less, we will send you a copy of the recording. Now, sort of a corollary to that is, please, this is not a venue to share any confidential information, as you know, not only whoever is here will be able to see that, but also uh, it may end up being sort of recorded and displayed in, in posterity. All right, let's, with, with that in mind, uh, let's get going. So I've got a few other important caveats. In today's conversation is general information meant to educate you on the venture capital ecosystem, what, is, what kinds of companies are eligible for venture capital financing, and uh, you know some of the general uh, patterns that we see in having these companies set up and financing. This is not legal advice. We'll talk about rules and exceptions and patterns and exception to those, those rules, but unless you know we consult and we do a conflict check and I get a written engagement agreement in place and we have a chance to actually go through all the facts or the attorney who you are speaking with has an opportunity to go through all those facts, uh, please don't take any of this as legal advice because that's not what it is. Same thing, same thing with uh, any questions that you ask today, or or even if you know I host uh, office hours and frequently will uh, be happy to to volunteer some time to again have a conversation and educate entrepreneurs on sort of the venture capital ecosystem and things that happen within it. Uh, and so same same caveat supply there. All right, let me tell you a little bit about my background. Um, then we're going to go over structural considerations. We'll talk about typical financing stages. We'll talk about documentation for founders and early employees, an overview of safes and convertible debt. Uh, we'll talk about valuation dilution. We'll talk about pro forma cap tables and give you an overview of venture capital financings and also some common pitfalls. So you'll see that is quite a lot of material to cover in about 60 minutes. That's what we're going to move through. So we'll be moving quickly. If you've got questions, please use the Q&A function. I'm going to try and move through a couple of slides. And then uh, after that, if there are questions, I'll try and answer them if they're applicable to what we just covered. And then, you know, there's going to be some time at the end, too. So if we haven't had a chance to answer your questions, and those are questions that are of general applicability, so that means they would apply to, you know, many and multiple different startups, then we'll answer them. Again, not legal advice. So, um, you know, I'm not, not here to answer your questions about any specific yes or no with respect to your, your company. Now, I think it's also worth noting that this is really going to benefit those folks who either have zero knowledge on the venture industry or those who are interested in pursuing uh, venture capital financing. Now, uh, it's not going to be designed to go into the details about safes or convertible notes or how to negotiate those, uh, but it will give you an understanding for how they work. Same thing with respect to venture capital financings, preferred stock financings more specifically. All right, so I'm an emerging growth and venture capital attorney. I've been practicing law since 2005. I'm in San Francisco, California, but I work with companies throughout the world and the United States because they frequently will come here to do business. I love working with entrepreneurs on financings as outside counsel and on exits. I'm a bit of an entrepreneur myself. Before I returned to big law, I ran my own shop, started with no clients, uh, and did that for about five or six years. And I bring that experience with me in working with 
entrepreneurs and, ex and executives who are growing businesses. And many lawyers haven't done anything like that. And so that sets me apart, makes me a bit unique. Let's review the audience survey. My goodness, we have 100% participation. I don't know if I've ever had that before. Um, amazing. So obviously, we've got a great audience here today. I'm going to share the results. Uh, we've got 21% who are live here in the Bay Area, another 15% from elsewhere in California, good strong showing, another 27% from the rest of the US. So I think we're kind of uh, up to about 60%, if you will, from, from the US. Uh, a few others from elsewhere in North America. We've got some folks from Asia. Thank you so much for being up. Uh, same thing. Australia, you're probably just kicking off the day here. So glad that you're with us. And then some folks from uh, somewhere else, maybe the Middle East, uh, maybe maybe the space station. I'm still waiting for that, that one to come in. Uh, we've got about 50% first-time entrepreneurs. That's great. I think uh, that's sort of who we typically expect to see. I think there'll be a lot of benefit for you folks. There are some serial entrepreneurs here. And uh, I think folks in those groups always also get some benefit out of it. You know, if you've got some questions, again, use the Q&A. Um, and one of the things that is always I miss about doing live events, and I've started doing some live events again. Uh, but one of the great things about live events is that I can actually sort of pull people in real time in the room and they can chime in on their experiences. So we won't be able to do that today, but uh, certainly find that when you've got serial entrepreneurs, somebody who's working on their second or uh, third company, we can tap into them and, and share that information. So moving right along, let's kind of zoom out, think about some of these structural considerations, think about big picture, what's going on here. So uh, the way I like to think about venture-backed companies is that you put in a number of inputs, including effort and time, and the company's gonna grow in value, it'll get larger. And those inputs are made up of a few different buckets, you know, capital, which will come primarily from the investors and ideas and other intangible assets. And then folks with technical skills who will build out sales and marketing and distribution and supply chains, et cetera, et cetera. You got to put in some money, put in some time, put in a whole lot of effort, a whole lot of sweat, some tears, maybe some blood, hopefully not too much blood. And you're going to end up... Uh, with a larger company. And the type of company that you usually will see here is gonna be a Delaware C Corp. Um, that's because you basically kind of take a look, at, you know, this 90, 95%, maybe even greater than that percent of the time. You take a look at what I like to call the matrix. You take a look at, you know, and this, is, this goes for any kind of business that you are setting up. Um, and so we apply it anytime someone walks into my office is interested in setting up a business. We, we run through this matrix. In those businesses, some things may be more important or more, more in a driving capacity than others. But the matrix is taxes, exposure to personal liability, that is exposure of your own personal assets, your car, your house, et cetera, oh, versus being able to create some protection, which is what a limited liability company or a corporation will be able to do for you, for example. You talk about the ownership structure and whether or not there'll be equity grants to employees and others. We talk about capital raising requirements and what, what the money is going to expect to see, what the money is going to want. Let's talk about management structure, who will be running the company, who will come in to involve some management. Many times in venture-backed companies, you know, by the time you've gotten to that preferred stock round, there's an investor on the board. Not all the time, but you know, many, many times. And certainly as you get to later stage rounds, there will be uh, representatives from, uh, from, from the venture capital funds on the board. Think about the exit strategy. And you also think about the regulatory framework because sometimes certain regulatory uh, environments, whether it's healthcare or finance, it, it begets the requirement of certain kinds of entities versus others. Now, Again, sort of the vast majority of the time, if we're talking about companies that are going to be venture backed, you're going to end up with a Delaware C Corp. Um, Delaware, because Delaware is known for having very good developed corporate law, uh, you know, generally speaking, has more liability protection for the directors and officers. And again, those VCs are going to want to have um, somebody on the board. So they're going to want to try and insulate and protect their people from liability. Uh, the Delaware Chancery Court, which is a sophisticated court that hears business issues, is great and, and quick. And then the Delaware Secretary of State's office is fantastic at processing paperwork, which you may think, well, that's kind of a 
pedantic reason for it. But I tell you, when you're trying to get a deal done and closed, not getting hung up in the Secretary of State's office can be quite critical. Uh, what pushes it to Delaware C Corp primarily is as we look through the matrix, it's the uh, capital raising requirements of the venture capitalists. They're going to require that. And, you know, you may ask, sometimes we get some Q&A, like, what if I've set myself up with an LLC, like is all lost? And, you know, not necessarily, not at all. I mean, don't panic. Come and see, you know, a competent attorney and they can work through the issue with you. Many times there are ways to... Um, convert, whether it's using a statutory conversion or using a, um, a merger structure to be a corporation, if that's what is necessary and appropriate. Um, and then timing also is one consideration on that. Now, I also want to just, well, maybe let's talk about the growth model, and I'll do that right here. So this this is a slide in, prog in progress. You know, you'll note I put valuation on the left-hand column and sort of time is the is the x-axis. And I don't have any numbers there. And I deliberately did not put any numbers because if I put 10 million, 20 million, 30 million, 40 million, 100 million, a billion, something like that, um, I'm concerned that the audience will glum onto that and think that that's the exact numbers that need, that is required for that business. But the point here is really, sort of evidencing that if we sort of think about the valuation of the company as it becomes more and more valuable, eventually it basically kind of starts off as nothing perhaps, right? When the founders are started. Um, but then, you know, time, efforts, inputs go by and you, hopefully you put together that team, you put together that product and the sort of angel, maybe beginning seed stage. You know, at that point, maybe you start going out, getting your first customers, uh, maybe you're showing product market fit. There's a lot of traction, a lot of demand for your product or service. And that's kind of when it really starts to tick up. And at that point, you know, whether that is labeled as a series C or series A, that sort of inflection point for most of these companies, um, that's when the venture capitalists are going to come in. As before that, it's going to be friends, family, and angels, other angels. Um, and then the VCs primarily come in once there's a, a product market fit. Now, that's not true in all verticals. So if you're in biotech, let's say that this may not apply, or if you are in a, a you know, you're working on technology or commercializing a technology that is very heavily, uh, very capital intensive, right? Like, you know, heavy industry hardware or something like that, you know, you may not, you may not have those, those customers till a little bit later, but that's the sense. And this is kind of the model growth path. So what company, what type of company is eligible for venture capital financing? Well, these are companies that are going to require a lot of capital, probably tens of millions of dollars. They're going to scale real quick within a sort of seven to 10 year horizon, um, at which point the value and their valuation is going to go up substantially from that, you know, from like an angel or a seed rounds, you know, could be 20, 30, 50, hundred X, something like that. And that's what venture capitalists are looking for because they've got their own investors and their own investors, which are limited partners, also known as LPs. Um, you know, they invest their money and the sort of typical thesis is the venture capitalists are going to make a bunch of different bets. Each one of which should be probably able to return the you know, 3x the value of the fund. That's where they're going to make all their money. And um, and they hope to have a few winners, a, a couple a couple real big winners to make to make their fund back over that seven to 10 year horizon. Uh, you, all right, I'm going to pause there, see if you have any questions. Because the again, sort of takeaways here, almost, almost always Delaware C Corp. If you got something else, don't panic. We're obviously also talking about the, here in the US primarily. Um, and gave you a bit of an overview as to which types of companies are eligible or kind of fit within the, the venture capital growth path model. Any questions? If so, use the Q&A. Otherwise, I'm going to take a drink of water before continuing on.
Uh, how to assess whether a startup could increase in value quickly. I, you know, that's something where you have to put together a business model and business plan and take a look at, you know, what's like the total addressable market. What's it going to take to go out and penetrate that market over that, you know, and, and not only just that market, but sort of within that market, you know, um, the sort of uh, service attainable uh, market that is like, what can you actually go out and capture, right? Because nobody can capture the entire market probably capture a portion of it uh and what capital is going to do that and that's kind of when you do that you know you kind of work backwards this is kind of where what we think we can kind of get to and how do i break it down raising successive rounds of capital to get it there and build the company out um what kind of return expectation at each stage of funding i'm not sure exactly of this question but i think you know typically startups are looking to double or triple every sort of 24 months or so is it easy to answer to an L from a transfer from an LLC to a Delaware C Corp? Um, it can be. It just depends on the situation of your company and the stakeholders within there. And you know, I mentioned a couple of different mechanisms. One might be either a statutory conversion or a merger, or it could be an asset deal. So it can be easy to to sort of change over from an LLC to a Delaware C Corp, but um, it'll just depend on your circumstances. Um, here's a great question. If you have family investing, do you treat them like angels or part of your investment? Um, sometimes I get this question where there's like a founder who maybe has uh, a fair amount of capital resources himself or herself or themselves. And they want to make an invest, you know, they want to go above what is sort of normal where, you know, maybe they put in a few grand or something like that. They want to put in something that would be equivalent to an angel amount, something along those lines. My usual sort of guidance is whether it's you as the founder putting in a substantial amount of capital, something equivalent to an angel, or you've got a friend or a family member uh, doing that, uh, you know, I try and treat everybody the same, you know, treat them well, you know, especially these early folks are taking a great big risk um, but do it in a way that's sort of defensible within the market, sort of treating them at fair market value so that at some point later, you don't have a later investor who's sort of, um, questioning whether or not it was prudent for you to have treated them so well or yourself so well. And similarly, if it's someone other than yourself, uh, you don't have a situation where later an investor thinks that you've kind of treated yourself too well and needs to reform that. Uh, what kind of data or evidence do you use to determine the, the potential of value increase at early stage? Um, look, there are all kinds of valuation models out there for early stage companies, um, you know, Berkus method and a bunch of other things. So you can go out and research them. Great places to look at include sort of medium or sometimes crunch base. I, think has articles on this. TechCrunch might as well. Um, what I've just sort of also seen from time to time, when, especially when we're talking about early stage companies, is because it is so difficult to impossible to tell of the value of an early stage, like really early stage, especially seed stage company, sort of valuation is sort of set more on just general market conditions and or what that company is looking to raise um, rather than trying to use financial metrics or models. You know, that changes as a company develops, starts having customers, starts having, you know, uh, predictable cash flow and as, you know, demonstrated product market fit, et cetera. So if you're trying to get yourself positioned for a venture capital financing, there's a well-worn path. We've talked about sort of high level, what the economics look like for these, what these types of companies, what they look like. Nuts and bolts, we've talked about the type of entity that's typical, but let's talk about uh, some of the other paperwork that's going to be critical. So that's intellectual property assignments, getting the IP, both whatever was done before the company was formed into the company and you know going forward intellectual property into the company, whatever gets developed after that. The other thing that's critical is to have a good handle on who's got an ownership stake in the company. So that really refers to 
you know, stock purchase agreements or option agreements if and when it's time to start granting options. Um, it's talking about vesting. So vesting is a concept where, um, sure, you may get the stock grant now, but it's got strings attached to it. So, you know, if you leave within a certain period of time, you don't get to keep all of your shares. The company gets to repurchase them for, you know, very little, basically probably what you bought, which is, or paid for, which is probably pretty little. Um, and, you know, that vesting will be both on stock options and it'll also be on, you know, shares going to the founders. Uh, and that, that those types of shares are called restricted stock. It's common stock. It's just common stock with some contractual restrictions on it. Now, sometimes I get the question, do we need to subject our shares to vesting? And, you know, certainly if you've got more than one founder, you should be thinking really hard and you should probably do that because the odds that someone will depart uh, are pretty high. Um, and if it is just one founder, maybe maybe you can wait. Some, sometimes I've seen that, it makes sense, but certainly by the time you get to work with sophisticated investors and certainly by the time you've got venture capitalists involved, they're gonna insist on their being investing. Now, that's one aspect to sort of tie who's got an ownership interest in the company. Another concept is just, well, can those people sell or trade or give their shares to anyone else, right? Um, and so that's where transfer restrictions come in. Um, you know, the company by and large and investors by and large don't want to necessarily have other new investors that have disparate or difficult interests or with the company, competitive interests with the company. So um, that's typically transfer restrictions will be found within this restricted stock purchase agreement that also has vesting in it. They might also get put in the bylaws. And sometimes also in other agreements, buying among the shareholders and or a company. And that's a, a really critical piece of foundation, all of this. Um, you know, obviously we haven't gone into everything. We haven't gone into employment agreements and those types of things. But if we're just talking about founder and early employee documentation, um, you know, if you're just getting started, this is the kind of stuff that you're going to need to have. Um, buttoned down, buttoned up. Now, if we move into sort of financing options, as you sort of get to, all right, well, now we've got the company sort of formed. we got to get some seed financing in to start to build out our model or our prototype or our beta. Uh, what, what do we use? So most commonly, there are a couple of options here. One would include selling common stock, which folks just do not do because there are a number of issues with it, which sort of include how is it that you value the company? What's the correct valuation? If, if you value it too highly, then the investors purchase too little for too much money. And if you value it too lowly, the investors purchase too much for too little. I said that correctly, I think. Um, so what, what gets used more commonly or is either convertible debt or convertible equity. Sometimes I'll refer to these things as convertible securities. Convertible debt is also known as bridge notes from time to time. I like to think of it as being sort of like the parent of convertible equity um, because by and large, it was sort of their first. Uh, and convertible equity is most commonly known and branded as a safe instrument. So a simple agreement for future equity and Y Combinator developed the safe um, and they are used all the time, especially in the Bay Area. I mean, 10 years ago, I think there was some reticence to use these things, but now I, I think it's probably the most common uh, instrument. Um, co convertible notes don't have standard forms or documents. So it, that's a little bit, I mean, everybody sort of has a standard form for it. I have a standard form for it too, but they're not like put out by one standard resource. And even safes do have some changes. Everybody does make some edits to their safe. Uh, another option would be doing a price round, a venture round, like a series A or series seed round. And we'll talk about those some more, but usually, you know, until you're talking about raising a few million, you're really talking about convertible debt or convertible equity. You're not talking about preferred stock financings. So 
I want to tell you just a little bit more about convertible securities before we kind of hit like the really major, um, the really major terms that are in there. Uh, so why convertible securities? We sort of talked about this earlier. It avoids valuing the company that selling too much for too little or selling too little for too much if you're the investor. Um, and it kicks the can down the road to the company's gotten a little bit farther along. Yet it also seeks to reward those earlier uh, investors by either a discount and or a cap. And we'll talk about those in a minute. Another advantage is it is far less expensive to do one of these convertible securities rounds as compared to a venture round. And then there are a few downsides. So especially for debt, convertible debt is something that has to get paid back at some point. So theoretically, if you hit the maturity date and it's not paid back, the investor could call the note and put the company under. And then, you know, debt sits above equity in the cap stack. And so if the company goes under or gets sold and is otherwise liquidated, it'll get paid first. Saves probably also get paid before common, um, but yeah. So let's talk about some really common terms, the big ones that are in there. So asterisks are next to things that are in convertible notes and items without asterisks are common to both of these. So maturity date, we talked about that. That's the date by which the note comes due. You got to pay the money back or you got to get an extension where you got to hope that the investor doesn't or the group of investors don't call the notes. Interest rate. So kind of like your credit card or your educational loans, uh, interest is accruing uh, and that's going to get converted over. Typically, that'll get converted over into equity when there's a preferred stock financing, but it's ticking. Um, conversion terms. So these are the terms, and we'll talk about some of these in a moment, but like, uh, you know, the terms under which the safer convertible note is turned into preferred stock or sometimes common stock, but most typically preferred stock. Uh, it's critical to make sure you've got the right type of amendment provisions within there. So, you know, you want to have the note or the safe amendable by the holders of the majority of interest that is like outstanding. So, you know, you don't want to have to go out to each and every safe or convertible note holder to effect an amendment. You want to be able to just go out to, you know, 500,000 and one dollars, whoever's holding, you know, the constituency that's holding in the aggregate 500 and 500,000 and one dollars out of the million or whatever that's outstanding. So you can't have a person or two hold you up. And then the remaining terms, at least in safes, are not that common to negotiate in convertible notes. Um, again, there's no standard. So, you know, many times there's not that much else to sort of negotiate, but sometimes you see all kinds of weird and wacky things in there. One thing that we never see, and that is really might signal that an investor is um, not sophisticated with respect to venture back companies is if they ask for a personal guarantee by the founder. So that would mean that the, the founder would have to go into the founder's own pocket to pay them back if the company can't pay them back. All right, I'm going to see if there are any other questions. So got a question about LLCs and DAO formation. So believe it or not, <laughs> there are specialists who focus on that. And I had, I have made the election in my career to not specialize on DAOs. Uh, so I, I'm not really going to weigh in on that. Um, uh, good question about how to split up the equity among founders. Um, I mean, look, there are many good questions that have come up already. Um, but I will, I will note that, that this is among those good questions. Uh, there is not a specific way to do this or not do it. <clears throat> there are a lot of tools that are out there 
that purport to kind of give you a framework for determining how equity should be split among founders. I think kind of at the end of the day, all of those tools are really sort of about each of the founders taking stock of what those founders, each founder is bringing to the table today and tomorrow, maybe adjusting for sort of risk, prior success, um, continued contribution, et cetera. Um, and it's, it's a negotiation. Uh, and so many times we do see it split equally. And then many times, you know, if there's a previously successful entrepreneur who's coming out and um, teaming up with some other folks, and the previously successful entrepreneur has a great technical background and really good business background and the contacts to really drive it, that technical, that, that previous founder may very well get more, even significantly more than the other founder. Not always, but, you know, these are the types of things that people kind of have to take stock of and then settle on something that works. Uh, for them in the long term and can feel comfortable with. Uh, because once relative ownership stakes get set, it can be hard to change um, and or can lead to terrible uh, personal dynamics if folks are trying to change them. So good question. All right, conversion term. So Conversion terms are the terms by which the safe or the convertible note will turn into preferred stock. Those terms usually include something called the next qualified financing, something along those lines. So that basically builds a mandatory trigger so that if X happens, the note or safe gets converted. In this case, it is usually the qualified financing, which gets defined probably as either an equity financing or a preferred stock financing, you know, sometimes of a minimum size, you know, the point of the minimum size is so that, you know, the founders can't go out and have, you know, negotiate with Uncle Bob to price the round at $2 million, to, excuse me, value the company at $2 billion, which, you know, depending on the terms of the note or the safe, could basically, you know, basically wash out the the safe or the convertible note holders. Um, so, you know, the sense is enough enough money has got to be in the game for it to be a legit round. Not all not all safes and convertible notes are built that way, but if you see that in there, that's sort of the underlying reason. Um, now we talked a little bit about this before and we'll go do some easy math, but like the discount is the mechanism by which the in investors are rewarded um, for putting in their money earlier than those series, the, those preferred stock investors are going to be. And we typically see something like 20, 25%. Um, pay attention to if you've got a safer convertible note, what the, what the, interest rate's going to be because interest will be accruing during these things. And that kind of acts a little bit like a boost to the discount. Um, conversion price cap, again, we'll talk about that, but that's another mechanism where if used, you know, regardless of whatever the pre-money valuation is that the new money is putting in or setting with respect to the new round of financing, um, you're just going to go with whatever that price cap is. And we'll do we'll do the math in a minute. It'll make a little bit more sense. Other times where we see conversion terms involve change of control or sale. So, you know, an exit. Uh, and then sometimes because of the maturity issue, which is that, you know, the note may become due prior to mature, excuse me, may come due before there is a preferred stock financing. Sometimes investors will want to have a mechanism to convert the convertible note into shares, typically of common stock, um, if you hit that maturity date. So I'm going to sneeze and see if there are any questions. Otherwise, we'll kind of walk into the and walk through the basics of valuation and dilution so that you can start to understand in a more concrete sense what I, the impact of what a discount is and the impact of what using a conversion price cap would do for you. Mm 
Okie dokie pokey. So valuation basics and dilution. So let's get some terms down. Pre-money value, and I've said these terms before, but didn't necessarily uh, define them. So pre-money valuation is the value of the company before the next round of investment. And post-money valuation is the value of the of the of the company after the round of investment. So there's some pretty simple math here, which is good because I'm a lawyer, not a mathematician. But if you take the pre-money valuation, you add the investment amount, that's going to equal the post-money valuation. And the other term is fully diluted basis. And sometimes this is called company capitalization. Sometimes it's fully diluted basis. In many of these things, there's a little bit of art into the in the definition, but the sort of basic concept is all common stock issued and outstanding, plus any other security or any other thing, any other thing that can be turned into or converted into either directly or indirectly um, into common stock. And by convention, we usually also include the shares that are reserved for equity compensation in the option pool. Now, what's something that can be converted directly or indirectly into common stock? Well, what if there were a warrant or an option for shares of preferred stock? So if that warrant or option were to be exercised, the person would get, or the entity would get preferred stock. Preferred stock is not common stock. Preferred stock is stock that has additional preferences or rights that common doesn't necessarily have. But typically, one of the rights or preferences that the preferred stock has is the right to convert into common. So that warrant or option that I was just mentioning would, you know, that would get counted and included because not that it could convert directly into common stock, but it could convert first to preferred and then to common. Um, and the safes and convertible notes actually kind of work that way too, because safes or convertible notes are designed to convert into preferred stock, not common stock. I hope you're all <laughs> hanging in there. Uh, feel free to ask some more questions. Uh, so let's like put this together in a very, very simple, simplistic manner, um, ignoring circular math and stuff that will come up. Uh, because we would use iterative calcs in Excel uh, and ignoring like if there were an option pool or other things like warrants or those types of things out there. But just to, and also not taking these numbers as numbers that you should use for your company, but again, because they're nice and big and round, it makes it sort of like the math easy to do during a lecture. Um so using this very simple example, we've got a company and let's just say that the investors have concluded and the founders have agreed that the pre-money valuation is $10 million for this company. Because these investors want to come in, they want to put in $3 million um, and they want to have like roughly 20% of the company when it gets, when this cl closes. So if the founders had all split 10 million shares, um, roughly, I'd be really more like 9,999,999 shares. And each founder had 3,333,333 shares. To figure out what the price per share is that the new money would pay, you take the 10 million pre-money valuation and divide it by the number of outstanding shares. Incidentally, the post money is the pre-money, which is 10 million, plus the new money coming in, which is 3 million. So it's a total of 13 million for the post money. And you'll see founder A went from having roughly 33.33% of the company to roughly 25% of the company. <clears throat> With a paper value now of roughly 3 million, $3.3 .3 million. So this is sort of setting the baseline fact pattern. Now I'm going to introduce this with some tweaks and some convertible securities that involve under one scenario, a discount, and under another scenario, a cap. And then we're going to weave these scenarios together so you can see what a cap and a discount 
effectively look like. And again, like, you know, this is all about how to position your company for venture capital financing. So getting it set up right with the right type of entity, getting that seed financings done with the right type of, uh, or the, the sort of typical way of doing these things is, is all about how you get set up for venture capital financing. So layering on the next layer before moving into venture capital financings. Let's talk about if there had been a convertible security out there for $450,000. Now, maybe really what's going on here is there are a bunch of convertible securities and we've, in the aggregate, they're worth $450,000 um, and they've all got the same terms. Now, if under the same scenario where each founder had 10 million shares, and in this case, if for whatever reason, everybody agreed that the new money was going to pay a buck a share, then if you were using the discount, it would be pretty simple. You would take the $450,000 that are outstanding for that convertible security, divide it by the product of one minus that 25% discount. And you'd see basically it's 450,000 divided by the discounted price, which is 25% off of a dollar is 75 cents. And when you do that, you'll see that the convertible security holder or holders in the aggregate will get a total of 600,000 shadow shares. Now you'll say, what, what the devil is a shadow share? And it's not part of the dark arts. Um, what you will see is it's basically same thing as what the new money is getting, but there are some economic adjustments because the convertible security holder got their shares for 75 cents a share instead of a buck a share. Now, in a situation where there was a convertible security and a cap was in effect, a $5 million cap, you'll see that the convertible security holder or holders in the aggregate would have gotten 900,000 shares. So again, you got the 450,000 shares, $450,000. In this case, you ignore, right, in the previous page, you know, in figuring out the price per share, it was the $10 million divided by the number of outstanding shares. In this case, you ignore the $10 million pre-money valuation and you plug in there 5 million bucks. So they're getting basically a 50 cents a share. And as a result, they get 900,000 shadow shares. Now, if you put these, so if you have an instrument where you've got both a discount and a cap, the investor will typically get the better of the two. And in this case, you'll see 900,000 shares is better than 600. So that's what they would have ended up with. Um, as a side note, and I will not do the math live, but as a side note, it's not as simple as waiting until the pre-money valuation gets to the cap. And then thereafter, once once the pre-money valuation exceeds the cap, um, you go with the cap. That's not quite how it works because of the math. If you've got a discount, um, there's going to be, it, it's going to be a little bit different than that. So let's talk about preferred stock financings, unless anyone's got any questions on convertible securities. And for those of you who are still here, I'm thankful you're strong. Uh, I think someone just signed out, but that's okay. Maybe they had to make dinner. <clears throat> Overview of venture capital financings. Well, if you have, let me let me give you a couple thoughts and tips. Which is, if you're if you want to go out to market, you know, hopefully you've set yourself up right, outright. You've set your your business up correctly. You've raised financing in a sort of standard vanilla manner, so that you're not going to spook any uh, venture investors, and you know. You don't have to worry about going back and trying to clean that up on the back end and you know not being able to get a stakeholder or stakeholders to sign off on that. And you've you've done it, you know, you've you've built a team, you've got pro, you know, got a product, you got product market fit, things are starting to scale. Uh, when you go out, you know, make sure you've got a credible business plan with milestones to continue that scaling process, you know, something that sort of tells the story of what the model was earlier, where it's like we've got this great hockey stick of growth and valuation because once we get, you know, this $10 million in, we're going to do this, this, and this within once, you know, and then at that point, our revenue should be at 
X, Y, and Z, and that's going to position us to go back out. That that story, right? <clears throat> Keeping in mind what venture capitalists are looking for, right? These are companies that are going to create home runs for them and return their fund within seven to roughly seven years or so. <clears throat> Make sure you've got enough capital in the bank from your earlier seed rounds before you go out so that you can't get like leverage, you can't have uh, lack of funds leveraged against you in negotiations. And build connections with the right investors prior to having to ask money for them. So, um, you know, that's in part to make sure that you can thread the needle and comply with the, the securities laws. But it's also about the fact that investors are people. And so uh, something that they already know or are familiar with before an ask makes it an ask easier and easier to get. And then understand your ideal term sheet. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And pre be prepared for thorough diligence. So that means, you know, be prepared to open up your books and records and let them see all of your contracts. And get ready for cleanup because no matter, you know, nobody expects early stage companies to be perfect. Uh, they expect them to be good enough. And, uh, you know, there's going to probably be some deferred maintenance <clears throat> along the way. So understanding your ideal term sheet. Well, first and foremost, you got to understand that this is a transaction in which a piece of your company is being sold. Now, you may not know exactly how much of your company uh, has been sold to date because of the mechanics of convertible notes sort of being based on, you know, something that's going to happen in the future. That is the preferred stock financing and the negotiation and the pre-money valuation in the future. But hopefully you've modeled it out. And certainly as you go to market, you can, you've you run models on how much the company is going to get sold in this round. And you know, based on the facts, you're going to use this money to scale up to here before raising this money over here, kind of what's going to, what's going to happen in the next round. Other terms are dividends, which are rights to be paid uh, on the stock. Those are not typically these days highly, highly negotiated, especially for early companies, but they're out there. Liquidation preferences. So that's who gets their money back first and how much do they get, you know, not just their money, but uh, whether they get uh, a higher, you know, great something greater than their, their money back. Um, and those you know, the last few years hadn't, you know, had been pretty in line with the common, which was basically usually the, the investor got either their money back, the greater of their money back, or what they would get if they had converted to common, but that's up, up a little bit more. Voting rights, uh, under what rights the preferred get to vote. Um, you know, how much of the company and dividends and liquidation preferences are sort of economic terms that influence, you know, if all goes well or not so well, what the outcome, the economic or financial outcome is going to be for the investor. One, another way that they control for risk <clears throat> is some control rights and or negative control rights. That is either, you know, the ability well, most more specifically, typically negative control rights, right? Like, so the ability to block the company from doing things, right? Block the company from selling itself, block the company from transferring its assets to some someplace else. Um, having insight at the board level, either by a, in, uh, an observer seat or by a board seat itself. An observer seat would give it, would give, uh, an observer seat would give the observer the right to observe and, you know, to attend the board meeting. It's not necessarily to vote or not to vote as a director, but just to attend and observe, maybe participate and talk, but not to vote versus a board member would actually have rights of a board member. We talked about optional and mandatory conversion. Again, that's sort of an economic uh, thing. Anti-dilution protection. So if there's a down round, do the investors get to get additional shares or adjustments, uh, basically the equivalent of additional shares? We talked about vesting for founders, right? So, you know, if you either don't have vesting set up or if you're already pretty much substantially vested, you know, the, the new investors are focused not on what happened yesterday in and of itself. They're focused on tomorrow. So what happened yesterday is helpful 
maybe prologue for what's going to happen tomorrow. But, you know, the fact that you fully vested, they want to make sure you're still in it for a long enough period of time for them to realize their investment in your company. So vesting may need to get reset, either implemented or reset in whole or part to make sure that everybody is aligned for the long term. Uh, who's going to handle the documentation? Um, the forms of documentation, is it going to be the National Venture Capital Association? Is it going to be seriesseed.com? Is it going to be something else? It's common for investors to uh, get attorney's fees or at least a portion of their attorney's fees covered. And that's also market to have limits to that. Uh, so, and then no shop and confidentiality provisions. They don't want you to go and use the term sheet against them once it gets negotiated. Um, and then the investors will get, well, many times they will get a right to a board seat or at least an observer seat. So um, that's kind of what's in a term sheet, you know, process for negotiating a term sheet. You've identified what it is that is good for the company. You know, you're out there networking with your investors and your network. Um, hopefully, I've gotten an opportunity to pitch to them. You know, maybe they've come back. They've gotten additional information from you. You started to plant the seeds as to what you would like to see. And they would typically uh, serve you up a term sheet, which you'd then mark up and go back and forth. And once you finalize it, there's still more to do. So uh, the diligence process, that's the opportunity for the investors to actually take a look at your company, you know, both from a business perspective and a legal perspective um, to make sure that, you know, or to, to assess the risk and the likelihood that the business is going to be able to realize the business plan that you put together. And then the documentation and mechanically that works by them providing a diligence request list. That might be several pages long, and you respond to it by putting those documents up in a data room. It's kind of like Box. Sometimes Box is used, um, or Dropbox. Sometimes Dropbox is used, uh, although at least we, we typically, when we're running our deals, have our own um, service that we host. We don't charge the clients for it, um, but it's got some additional functionality, which is really helpful. Uh, and then documentation. So you know, if you're interested in what the documents look like, you can go to nbca.org, uh, look at the model legal documents. That's probably the most common deal docs that are done in the US are based on that. I mean, I would say probably at this point, like 90, 95%. Those are the main financing documents. Um, not super common to have a legal opinion in an early round, but sometimes that creeps in there. Just think of what else I want to say. You know, other documents that are not in there include, you know, the corporate authorization documents that need to get done. So board consent, stockholder consent. They're, they're typically in these rounds, 20, 30 different documents that get negotiated um, and that all sort of fit together. And then closing, closing is when everything has been completed. Diligence has been completed. All the financing documents have been negotiated. Um, most likely signature pages have been circulated ahead of time and collected. Uh, and, you know, board consent gets done, stockholder consent gets done, the new certificate of incorporation gets filed. Everybody takes stock of everything, makes sure that it's there, and then the money gets wired over in exchange for the stock. And that's the closing. And then post-closing, there's lots of action items that need not, I mean, not nearly as much work as before the closing, but there are typically a lot of action items. Um, so for example, notices to other stockholders who didn't participate in the vote might be required. Um, certain certificate, certain uh certain uh securities filings probably need to get made. Sometimes there have been covenants made in the agreements, like maybe getting key person insurance or fire insurance in place, those types of things. Uh, all that stuff gets taken care of post-closing. Um, question about when should a startup get in touch with potential seed investors? Um, I mean, 
you know, there's sort of one school of thought that you should always be engaging in the market um, and, and developing relationships before you need them. So, you know, I think, you know, at, at least in a non sort of solicitation capacity, you should, you know, consider um, developing relationships before you, you know, you're looking to, to raise from them. So kind of all the time, maybe, <laughs> you know, cause you also never know. Sometimes that creates opportunities too, um, whether that's with, uh, um, potential acquirers or whether that's with other commercial parties that you could do business with. And then moving into common pitfalls, we've got many, um, non-compliance with securities laws, including using finders. So finders are people who, at least here in the U.S., are not registered broker-dealers, but they're, you know, making money off of um, affecting sales of securities, basically. And, um, and you know, that can be a securities law violation, which, you know, uh, can can lead to basically the money having the the company having to give money back, which is a problem if it's already been spent. Um, other regulatory issues. Look, so many businesses are regulated these days. You know, if you are consumer facing, you're going to have privacy and personally identifiable information in there, which is becoming subject to more and more regulation. If you are in the health tech or med tech space, you know, again, you, you may have uh, uh, personal health information. Additionally, there may be, you know, uh, issues with respect to whatever it is that your product or service is doing. So for example, you know, if it's being used in a diagnostic capacity, or is it being used as a therapeutic, something like that. Um, FinTech, a uh, lot of regulation in banking. So again, nobody necessarily expects the startups to um, be 100% compliant with all regulations that are out there. But certainly by the time that you are raising venture capital financing, it's quite likely, um, or not quite likely, like, you know, you're, you're going to need to share with the investors kind of what your plan is with respect to the regulations. So you at least need to know the landscape that's out there. <clears throat> and um, likely sort of what your approach to that is, you know, and, you know, if you are really risk tolerant and you think that it is achievable, sometimes the, well, we'll just grow so fast. We'll get there before, you know, before the regulators kind of clamp down on us and we'll get the law changed. Um, or many other times it is, well, we're going to use this money to do this and that, and then we're going to, you know, make sure that we get in compliance here, et cetera. You know, not managing your cap tables, not knowing who's on cap tables. We talked about that earlier. Thinking there are standard terms. I mean, even within safes, as I mentioned, like there is, there are amendments, not amendments, but there are, uh, everybody puts in some different provisions. Uh, there's usually a realm of what's normal or what's standard or what we like to call market, but that doesn't mean, you know, there's like a standard form for anything. Side letters are letters that are outside of the main financing documents, whether you're in a convertible, doing a convertible security or a, um, or a preferred stock financing. They're very common. Um, it may or may not make sense. And, you know, one thing about side letters are each one of them is a side negotiation. And so um, that can cost a, a fair amount of money to do that. Oh, uh, sorry, hold on one second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, all right, side letters can be separate negotiations um, and can be problematic. Additionally, uh, once you have these things in place, you got to comply with them, and that can be problematic for for other reasons, right? So, be be mindful, be intentional. Um, if investor is interested in doing a side letter, it may make sense or it may not make sense. Some of the things that are inside letters include pro rata rights. That is the ability for those investors to invest in later rounds, which in one sense may sound good, but in later rounds, if you're doing really well, 
uh, and there's not enough room, it can be problematic. It can also be problematic to just manage and comply with that. Other things include information rights. Sometimes if you're re re receiving an investment from a strategic investor, they may ask for certain commercial terms, which may make sense now or could be potentially problematic in the future, might deter some other potential acquirer. So being uh, paying attention to that's important. You know, failure to follow corp proper corporate authorization can lean to a lot of cleanup and uncertainty and maybe having to give the money back as well as potentially, you know, civil or criminal liability if it's bad enough. Uh, not forming an entity or not forming the right entity. You know, this gets into the bucket of, uh, you know, many things can be cleaned up, but sooner is usually better than later, even if it just means taking stock and assessing and get a plan in place. Vesting is critical because you don't want someone to walk out with a huge chunk of the company if they're not going to continue to participate. 83B elections, so if there is vesting, there can be some nasty tax consequences associated with that unless you file an 83B election within 30 days from when, when you receive the stock. So that's pretty critical. Um, you know, of course, there's always employment law issues and other napkin promises, other undocumented stakes in the company. Um, and one thing that comes up from time to time also is folks trying to keep IP, if the IP is not properly buttoned up into the company. So whether you're coming out of a larger company or if you're coming out of a university, making sure there's a good chain of title and defensible, you know, more than defensible, there's a good chain of title on that IP. And then tax issues come up that can derail things. So that is the hour. Uh, getting yourself or how to position your company for venture capital financing is about getting started with the right company, getting financed on the right path and avoiding common pitfalls. I'm Jason Putnam Gordon. Thank you for joining me today. We're going to move into questions and answers. So we've got a solo founder. And the solo founder wants to know what's the best way to sort of start if you're going to add raise capital and add co-founders in the future. Get in touch with an emerging growth and venture capital attorney who practices in this space. Um, that attorney can help you. You know, one thing is, uh, you know, some of these issues in terms of vesting and other things are maybe not as critical, at least right and in initially, right, uh, right off the bat for a solo founder. But certainly, making sure that you've got like the right fundamentals in place is going to be uh, important. So, any other questions? No. All right. I'm going to wait like five more seconds. Okay. Uh, how do you find seed investors? So it was particularly difficult, I think, you know, in the time that we just, you know, are sort of coming out of, but it's great to go to events that are um, in the sphere or the vertical that you're in to, to meet and mingle with folks who are interested Moving into your personal network is something that's critical. Um, your seed investors are going to be likely, you know, friends and family at first, and then others who are interested in the space. So getting connected to them is kind of what you want to focus on. Uh, yes, we can we can cover tax issues with startups, although we've got tax attorneys who handle that. Um, and sometimes CPAs also are good at handling the tax issues too. Sometimes they're less expensive than the tax attorneys. Tax attorneys are fantastic at complicated situations that require either creative solutions or um, a solution actually has never been invented before. So it, it does involve some creativity. So that's where the tax attorneys really excel. And then uh, accountants can be really good as well. Uh, there's a specific question about 
mining in Canada. So happy to have a conversation, happy to set up time and office hours. My email is jason.gordon at klgates.com. Ah, wonderful. Accredited investors versus non-accredited investors. Um, so I'm I'm a big proponent, you know, having been in this space for quite a while, I'm a big proponent of having accredited investors on the cap table for a couple of reasons. Um, first and foremost, if, it, you, you know, investing in a startup is a highly risky endeavor, that person needs to be able to lose all of their investment. They need to not get it back, not get a return on it for 10 years, let's say, and they need to be able to lose all of their money. So, you know, an accredited investor is typically sort of one way that you can kind of get a sense for whether or not this person is able to uh, tolerate the loss of their investment. And this is, this is true also so for friends and family. I mean, you know, I think, you know, founders should not be raising money from folks who cannot afford to lose the money. That's just straight up. Um, it's different than different businesses. If you had a different business where there was going to be a return and it was less risky, fine. But for typical venture back companies, that's different. Um, let me also maybe zoom out for a second. Um, I believe it's under Rule 501. Uh, is where the definition of a credit investor is. For individuals, you're usually talking about people who earn several hundred thousand dollars a year or have more than a million dollars. I don't want to get into the nuances of, you know, when you include their equity or don't include their equity in the house. But, you know, we're talking about wealthy individuals or entities that have several million dollars typically in assets. Now, additionally, in addition to the investor's profile being able and tolerant to lose all of their money. Having non-accredited investors on the cap table can, pre can present issues with later transactions, whether they are later financings or later mergers or acquisitions or exits. Because many times with respect to either financings or with respect to an exit, there may very well be involves uh, uh, sales of securities involved, right? So if your company is going to exit to another private company, that private company may not have enough cash to pay all cash to get you out, in which case maybe that company does a blend of cash and stock in that new company, right? Especially if that company is a strategic acquirer and it wants to bolt in your product or service or offering or something along those lines, in which case having non-accredited investors in there in order to comply with securities laws can dramatically increase the cost to effect that, that transaction. <clears throat> and so again, non-accredited investors can be a problem there. Same thing also with respect to, you know, when a company may be forced to go public, um, you know, there are some rules around that and having non-accredited investors on the cap table can be a problem. That being said, not all companies have cap tables that are made up, you know, <laughs> one does not always see companies that always have not, uh, that always have accredited investors on the cap table, um, but strongly, strongly encourage, especially for those financing rounds that companies first really try hard to get accredited investors on a cap table. Um, question about crowdfunding, how would it raise the funding round in the future? Uh, again, you know, venture capitalists are focused typically on a on a particular type of company, and they're focused in coming in typically at a typical uh, specific stage, stage of product market fit. Um, you know, companies there are definitely many companies that have raised crowdfunding and then raised from venture capitalists. I will also tell you that I host and moderate venture capital panels with venture capitalists, and this question comes in many times. And many, many, many times the venture capitalists say crowdfunding, like, you know, are, you know, we're not out there looking for those types of companies. So, you know, it just, it just really depends. Um, again, what the venture capitalists are, are first and foremost concerned about is being able to make an investment in the type of company that's going to return their fund, a sufficient return on their fund. And so if there's a business story as to why, you know, if you've raised crowdfunding, like it's, 
you know, not going to interfere with that trajectory, I think you can get them comfortable with it. Um, there's a question about safe agreements stating, you know, basically there's a rep in many safe, there's a representation. So that's a statement of fact in safe agreements in most convertible notes that indicates that uh, credit investors are accredited. Uh, must the founder verify or trust? Uh, we always, I, I always have them, <clears throat> you know, do additional diligence on that, on that investor. Now, um, you know, I don't want to get into legal advice, but, you know, there are some people who are known to have sufficient assets. You know, if you are the, you know, it, you know, a billionaire listed on Forbes list and you're investing personally, it's, it's probably, you know, it pro pro seems like, you know, you've done that diligence and you confirmed and, you know, you may not, you may not need to go any further than that, but we look at each, we do, we certainly do want to see, especially for individuals, um, doing additional diligence uh, on that. And again, like if, if the investor is going to be a company and that pump, that company is like publicly listed and their financials are publicly disclosed. And you can tell by looking at those financials that they meet the criteria, well, maybe you don't need to get an accredited investor statement from that. And same thing with the fund, right? There's many times there are funds that sort of disclose, we've got $2 billion in assets under management, something along those lines, but it's merely relying on the rep itself, um, you know, might be to the peril of the founder. And the consequence of that for, for those folks who are still with us here is that you know, if you can't hit that securities exemption, you can't meet all the requirements of it, then um, it's possible that, you know, there might be a right of rescission for those investors that might have a right to get their money back. All right, any other questions? All right. Well, fantastic. I'll give you back a few extra minutes to get back to building your great company. I'm Jason Putnam Gordon, an emerging growth and venture capital attorney with KNL Gates LLP, which is a full service, fully integrated global law firm on five different continents with, I believe, 50 offices at this point, close to 50 offices, at least 2000 attorneys. Deep history in venture and tech. A few things that set us aside from our competition are our global footprint and the regulatory experts that we have. I work with emerging growth companies from formation through their exits. I also work with investors as they deploy capital into those companies. I want to thank Idea to IPO for setting up today's event. I want to thank my firm for sponsoring it. I want to thank each of the attendees who are live, who are with me here tonight, and those who are watching on a time-shifted basis. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time and uh, look forward to the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.